Assalamualaikum. So I'm going to read a paper and um, I'm going to try to speak loudly every once in a while so you don't fall asleep. I know it's, uh, we open the door so it's, it's not so hot. Um, some of this is going to be a little, might sound a little extreme. My paper is on accountability in the Islamic tradition. And what I'm really doing is lifting up some very maybe strong examples in order to, to make the point about the kinds of principles that we're thinking about and that what is possible. But if this is possible, then we can at least, as, as Muhammad says, we can at least do something, right? So let me begin with uh, a little story uh, about the Umayyad Caliphate. So at the beginning of the second century of Islam, the Umayyad Caliph or King, Yazid II, appointed his brother Hisham ibn Abdamanik to be his successor. At the same time, he appointed his own son, Walid II, as crown prince. Hisham was kind and supportive to Walid after the death of his father. But when as a teenager he began to, quote, show signs of wanton behavior and drink wine, Hisham tried to restrain him by separating him from his drinking buddies and decreasing his allowance. In protest, Walid, following the example of some previous Umayyad rulers, invoked the core theological doctrine of Qadr to claim that he had a right to the allowance he had been receiving and a right to, the, to inherit the caliphate no matter how he behaved. He rebuked his uncle's actions saying, I never thought that God would test a mutin mu'minin like this, nor that he would defame me like this. The succession which God has decreed for me, the span of life which he has ordained for me, and the substance which he has allotted to me are matters which nobody apart from God ever diminish by one jot in their appointed term, nor can anyone change their allotted times in any way. For Qadr runs according to his predetermined decisions, irrespective of the wishes of men. Hisham replied to Walid's invocation of Qadr, saying, As for that which you say God has ordained for you, it was God who gave me, Amir al-Mu'minin, precedence in that respect. And he chose him, meaning me, for it, and verily a God, God attains his purpose. The commander of the faithful has come to the firm conviction that it is not for his own profit that he possesses what God in his goodness has given him for the attainment of good or evil, but that it is only a trust and manna to him from God, and that inevitably he will one day relinquish it, meaning he will die. Now, despite Hisham's fears about Wadid, he didn't take more action to or he didn't revoke his nephew's appointment. For the Umayyads had developed a custom that caliphal appointments to dynastic succession are binding. And even if Hisham wanted to revoke it, Walid had a group of strong supporters whom he had bought with patronage. And so challenging him would risk great upheaval. When Walid became caliph after the death of Hisham, he boosted his support among the public by showering benefits upon the Syrians, including the poor and disabled, pilgrims, soldiers, and large influential families. He sent out floridly rhetorical letters describing his authority as divinely decreed and established by a chain of transmission from the Prophet Muhammad the caliphs of God succeeded each other as sovereigns. So this is this is this is a chain of transmission of political authority, right? The caliphs of God succeeded each other as sovereigns over that which God has made them inherit from His prophets and that which He entrusted to them. No one contests the rights of the caliphs without God striking him down. Walid only became more intoxicated with power and wine. Tabari says that his behavior troubled his subjects and his army deeply, and they hated what he was doing. But Walid brutally suppressed any opposition. He had his cousins tortured and killed. He had Yahya ibn Zayd ibn Ali, the descendant of the Prophet, killed, his body mutilated. 
burned and his ashes scattered in the Euphrates. In the end, it was one of his older cousins, Yazid III, who gathered effective opposition against Walid. Yazid claimed that he did not call for Walid's assassination, but that he only sent soldiers to demand that Walid should submit to Ashura. But Walid was killed in a skirmish with the soldiers, and his rule came to an end. I think most, most Muslims today, and even at that time, saw this Muslim leader's use of core Islamic theological beliefs and discourse to justify his oppression, immoral behavior, and plundering of the treasury to be revolting. Indeed, it was such actions and the reactions against them which set the core questions and framing for the development of the schools of Islamic theology. Today, when we speak about the great harm that can be caused by spiritual abuse, we recognize that oppression enabled and justified by religious concepts and enabled by religious systems of power has the particular harmful effect of alienating many from religion itself and even destroying or harming an individual's relationship with God. <clears throat> As for the issue of removing an unjust ruler from a position of power, well, historically, Muslims never came close to a consensus on how this should be done. For much of our history, justice and stability had an e uneasy coexistence at the highest level of political power. Sunni Islam's relatively efficacious response to this challenge was to insist on a limitation of the powers of the ruler, permitting executive authority but within limits, and restricting interpretive authority to qualified scholars. Separation of powers, limits to authority, established criteria for those considered scholars, and other checks and balances became integrated into Islamic systems. It is such principles and systems that we need to build up today in our Muslim communities to make them places of safety, safety dignity, and spiritual upliftment for all those who are present. This evening, I want to consider in particular the issue of accountability in uh, uh, issues of accountability. In the Islamic states of the pre-modern period, apart from the ruler, it was the norm that all others who held positions of public authority were supervised and were held accountable by someone with more power, greater authority. Chains of commands and paths to accountability were known and generally accessible in traditional Islamic societies. Parents, husbands, guardians, agents, military commanders, teachers, scholars, preachers, sheikhs, trustees, wak supervisors, mutawalli or nadir, judges and governors, all who exercise some power and authority over others could in turn be called to account for violating the rights of those over whom they had authority. Now, Today, it's very common when uh, a public figure or holds a position of trust in the Muslim community is uh, uh, an accusation is launched against them. We hear cries of innocent until proven guilty from supporters of religious figures, these religious figures. Now, the fact that contemporary Muslims respond to violations of trust with an aphorism drawn from the principles of criminal justice systems is revealing of the extent to which the community's moral compass is obscured by legalism. This legalism not only excludes the majority of norms established by the Quran and Sunnah, but it is a selective narrow legalism which ignores many aspects of the Islamic legal system, as Muhammad mentioned. Um, these include certification of witnesses, public regulation, hisba. Um, and administration, administrative law, siyasa sharia. The latter in particular includes the regulation and supervision of public officials with means that cannot be applied to people who do not hold positions of public authority. 
Biographical literature and regional histories are filled with colorful accounts of powerful officials and corrupt scholars being brought low by their misdeeds. Here are just a few cases gathered by uh, Eskovitz in his 1984 study, The Office of Hadi and Kodat in Cairo, under the Bahri Mamluks. In the year 670 of the Hijra, the poet, Taqiyuddin Shabib bin Hamdan, wrote a letter to the Sultan claiming that the chief judge, Hadi al Qudat, Shams al-Din ibn al-Ahmad, had retained for himself deposits of merchants who had died. The Sultan summoned the judge who denied the claim. So the Sultan had his house searched and found the deposits. The deposits were returned to the rightful heirs. The judge was jailed and his house confiscated. In 738 Hijri, the Hanbali judge Izzuddin ibn Awad was summoned by the emir after receiving a claim that the judge had embezzled money from the sale of a waqf dedicated to orphans and other needy persons. The judge was punished and removed from his post, and in the same year, three other judges were removed from their positions for corruption. Some judges got into trouble for nepotism, including for appointing their own children as overseers of al -Qaf, and then those children mismanaged the finances. From the time the first Muslim community was established and throughout Islamic history, there has been a clear principle that when a person accepts the position of power or authority, such as religious leadership, or being a judge, or being an imam, a scholar, religious teacher, preacher, or spiritual guide, they have to accept that their actions will be scrutinized more closely than others. This is because they have accepted a trust that affects not only large numbers of individuals, but also influences the resilience and cohesion of the community. Scholars, preachers, and teachers become role models to many. And when they leverage their position or status, personal gain, disillusionment, and alienation from religious life for many can be consequent. At the beginning of Islam, even those who did not have an official position per se, but had a privileged status in the religious community, often served as role models and had higher expectations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, chose the mothers of believer of the believers, Umun Hatim meaning to have this status. They had no political or judicial office, but they were moral exemplars for the community and were told by Allah that if they engaged in manifestly immoral conduct, they would suffer twice the punishment as others who committed the same act. At the same time, Allah promised these blessed women that their heavy moral burden would be compensated by their earning twice the reward as others for any good they did. And of course, Allah gave them grace to retain that position and that added moral responsibility. Even the appearance of wrongdoing can damage the trust people have in institutions and systems that are critical to the functioning and ongoing transmission of religious knowledge and norms. Yes, all believers are required to extend the benefit of the doubt to others. At the same time, those in positions of public leadership have the responsibility not only to avoid wrongdoing, but to avoid the appearance of wrongdoing as much as they are able. Because trust is so fragile. Cynicism about leaders is widespread and easily exploited by those who wish to exacerbate divisions in society. There are many examples of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam modeling this behavior, including the well-known story of when he was standing with one of his wives in a darkened doorway and called out to some companions who were hurrying along that this was the Bint uh, Puyye. Now, some of you who know me uh, know that um, my I have a deep and abiding affection for Sayyidina Umar ibn al Sadat, may Allah be pleased with him, and uh, gave a number of lectures on Amir al Mu'mineen 
عمر was Umm al Mu'minin, Aisha last year for Cambridge Muslim College. So I often refer back to his example, as do other Muslims when they're looking at the development of administrative law and good governance in Islamic society. Ahmed was particularly mindful of, of the appearance of wrongdoing to the point where he also gave very strict instructions to his family to, uh, to avoid any appearance that they were benefiting from him being good in what we mean. If we turn to uh, uh, the traditional Islamic legal system, we see we, there are many examples, but I'll just give one example of upholding higher standards for someone who exercises power over others. And that is the denial of the certification of probity, adala, for witnesses, so official witnesses, whose lifestyle is intercultural even if that person's actions, all of their actions are legal. In other words, in the traditional Islamic legal system, an individual could be rejected as an official witness if he, even if he or she adhered strictly to the laws of prohibition and obligation, but they failed to conform to customary standards of respectable behavior. Here's a typical statement by the 11th century Shafi jurist Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi, about rejecting such a person as a just witness. Testimony is not accepted from someone who has no baru'a, such as a singer or a dancer, okay, we might understand this, but also a person who eats in the markets and walks around with his head uncovered in a place that is not customary to expose the head. Professor Marion Katz, another friend of ours, we study with together here, Muhammad and I, in an excellent article on uh, the topic of, um, uh, of emotion in Islamic uh, jurisprudence says, Muru'a is canceled by actions that indicate deficient attentiveness to social disapprobation or lack of inhibition. So in other words, um, these people who uh, were said to have not had Moruwa, which is often um, translated as manliness, but I think that's a kind of old fashioned uh, way of translating it. I think that respectability or dignity is a better translation. So my point in uplifting these criteria is not to, to endorse them for Muslims today, but to show that in establishing these criteria, Muslim jurists held the principle that those being considered for appointment to a public position could be rejected on the basis of behavior that was in no way unlawful. Rather, those jurists were literally using culture to cancel witnesses. If this was the case for witnesses, how much more for those who have more influence and power over many vulnerable people? It's also the case that public officials could be prohibited from engaging in lawful actions simply out of a broader public interest. For example, Sayyidina Omar appointed Hudayfa the governor of Adain. Omar became aware that a number, uh, the number of unmarried Muslim women there had increased beyond what was typical. And then he heard that his governor had married a Kitabi woman. So Amish sent him a message saying, divorce her. Hulayfa well, said he would not do that unless Amr told him first whether the marriage was lawful or unlawful and what the purpose of his order was. Amr responded that it was a lawful action, but that Arab men were too captivated by the Kitabi women, and he feared that the men would keep drawing closer to them and being alienated from the Muslim women. Hearing this explanation, Hodefa did what Omar asked him to do. Now, we often hear about Sayyidina Omar accepting public complaints and correction for himself. The example of a woman publicly objecting to his lawful executive order, and you could say, or you could argue, putting an upper limit on the mahr comes to mind. But what about his appointees? Whenever Sayyidina Omar appointed his governors, he would walk out with them to, you know, out 
to the edge of the city to bid them farewell. And he would say, I have not appointed you governor over Muhammad's community with limitless authority. I have made you governor only to lead them in the prayer, to make decisions among them based on what is right, and to distribute the wealth among them justly. I have not given you limitless authority over them, as you repeated this twice. So here we have a brief, succinct job description, as well as this reminder that this authority and power is limited. In another uh, speech, actually it was in a Friday sermon, Sayyidina Almer said, and he preached this in the member, people, I do not send governors to you to flog you or to take your possessions. I teach them, I send them to teach you your religion and the sunnah. If anything other than this is done to anyone, he should raise the matter with me. Complaints process. Right? It was opening the path for this complaints process. To him in whose hand is my soul, I shall certainly permit the law of retaliation to be used against them. Now, Amr ibn al-As jumped up and said, will you really permit the law of retaliation to be used against any commander appointed over your subjects who disciplines one of them? And Amr answered, yes, I will certainly permit that. Why should I not when I have seen the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, allowing the law of retaliation against himself? Now, these reminders and ideas are wonderful. The question is how to make them effective. And here we see that, as with his administration in general, Sayyidina Umar looked for effective means to open these paths for complaints and revision. So one example, it was Umar's practice to require each one of his governors to make the pilgrimage every year. And he did that in order to isolate his governors away from their subject to give them time to make a complaint and to make sure that the complaint got to Amir al-Mu'minin. So every year, in addition to everything else, he would take them away from the community once a year. Now, when it comes to individuals holding public positions, positions of power and authority, the Islamic tradition is quite clear on the steps to be taken when there's an accusation of misusing their position rather than personal wrongdoing. And the principle is suspended until investigated. This is a widespread, you know, perhaps universal practice in places that where there is a rule of law. Even if we look just a few decades before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian codified Roman law, and among the components of this new um, codification of Roman law was the Institutes and introductory textbook used for law students. In the section dealing with guardians and curators who are suspected of abusing their authority, the text says he is suspended from the administration until the action is executed. And when you look at the early Khulafa Rashidun, we see that this was their practice. If there's a complaint, then the people are suspended. Of course, Sayyidina Ahmed, you know, there's many colorful accounts, um, and he's at the, the, the beginning where he's really trying to get these um, ethics into people. So uh, just one story, when uh, one time, a man stopped Sayyidina Umar in the street of Medina and he complained to him that Sayyidina Umar wasn't sufficiently aware of what one of his governors was doing. And he made a complaint against him. So uh, Umar summoned the man, gave him a staff, a wool shirt, and some sheep and said, pasture them for your father was a shepherd. So he sent him out to pasture these uh, sheep for a while. Then he brought him back told him about the complaint and gave him instructions to avoid symbols of wealth or status. The point is not to humiliate people in positions of power. And of course, the dynamic there is different. And of course, our executive authorities are not saying, no, Ahmed, this is inshallah, a cooperative effort that we do together. But again, these extreme examples are to just bring home the point that these principles are 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 firmly founded in the Islamic tradition from the beginning. 
you know, sometimes uh, Sayyidina Ahmed would relieve people or uh, have them be um, not suspended so much as uh, kind of on leave for a little while from their position simply because he was afraid that the dynamic, the power dynamic was becoming unhealthy. And this was the case with uh, Sayyidina Khalid ibn al-Walid. May Allah be pleased with him who of course sacrificed a great deal fighting for the sake of the Muslim community. But after one particularly successful campaign in the year 17, uh, Sayyidina Khalid came back with a great deal of wealth. And, uh, and Omar heard that um, people were flocking to Khalid, seeking, you know, seeking to benefit from him and to benefit from his wealth. And he heard in particular about one large gift that Khalid gave to uh, one individual. So Sayyidina Umar sent a message to Khalid's commander, Abu Ubaidah, telling him to summon Khalid to appear before him, to tie him up with his own turban and to take off his cap until he disclosed the source of the wealth he had given to this individual. Abu Ubaidah had Khalid appear before him in public in the mosque. This is the case of a of a public uh, investigation, but again, culture is different, the situation is different, but in this case, it was a public investigation. Abu Obeda asked Khalid about the source of the money, and Khalid, when he didn't answer him, it was saying the Balan who stepped forward, took Khalid's own turban off, tied him up with it, took his cap off, leaving Khalid's head uncovered. Bilal said, speak up. Was it from your own pocket that you gave this money or was it from the collective wealth of the Muslim community? And at this point, Khalid said, no, I gave him money from my own wealth. I did not give him something that belonged to the community. And this is very touching, I think. Then Sayyidina Bilal untied him. He put the cap back on and he himself wrapped uh, Khalid's turban around his head again. He said, we hark unto our governors and obey them, and we honor and serve our masters. Meaning of Khalid. Yeah, it's very difficult, but beautiful, um, I think, example of trying to keep in balance, you know, these, these virtues. Sayyidina so, Ahmed later sent a message to be led to be read out to the community there. And he said this, so that everyone would know, and this was read out in public. I did not relieve Khadid from his post because he caused me displeasure or because of deceit on his part, but the people were captivated by illusions on account of him. And I was afraid they would confer too much trust upon him. And consequently, they and he would be tested. I wanted them to realize that it is Allah who is the creator of all things, including success and more. And I did not want them to be subject to this fantasy. Now, was this discipline or relieving or suspension of Khalid too much, maybe? And sometimes Ahmed himself admitted that he went a little bit too far in his rigor of trying to uphold the principles. And we want to be careful not to exalt executive authority too much because that too can get out of control, as it did with Walid, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, or other kings or caliphs after Sayyidina Omar. In our time, the executive boards of our institutions are sometimes responsible and aware of their responsibilities and limitations, and sometimes they're unqualified, ill-informed, and misuse their power. So the point in this talk is not to say, say that we um, instate or reinstate a 7th century or a 12th century or a 16th century model of separation of powers, limits on authority, effective and ethical uh, supervision and complaint system, but we need to take seriously our responsibility and to put systems in place and those systems will function well only with broader education and an understanding of the needs in our community. So to conclude, it is complicated to put our values and principles into action, and we often have to live in a state of ambivalence and uncertainty. 
A confident Muslim does not mean that we always know that what we're doing is the right or the best thing. To be confident means that we accept that we live with in this state of uncertainty with the knowledge that all our creator asks of us is that we keep striving to purify our intentions, to keep learning, to repent of our wrongdoings, to repair our relationships, and to have them governed by knowledge, by collaboration, by shura, by knowledge of the tradition and of all the facts we need. So our view at the Hormer Project is that we certainly need to work harder to close the gap between our Islamic values and our Muslim community realities. In a letter Sayyidina Ahmed wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari with instructions on how to exercise his administrative and judicial power, he said, it is useless to talk about a right that is not enforced. Claiming a good intention does not excuse us from the duty, <clears throat> from the neglect of duty. So we ask God to guide us. We're uh, just, I particularly am so grateful that we, our community has reached a point where we have people who have so much expertise and knowledge, so many different fields that are necessary for us to lift ourselves up together. And I'm really grateful for to all of you for helping us uh, try to reach this goal of, of ever more working to close this gap between our Islamic values and our competing realities. Thank you.